I'm getting too excited. Now we're doing a draft show. Damn it. Here we go. You are locked on Cardinals. Your daily Arizona Cardinals podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Come in, Locked On Cardinals. Alex Clancy here. Follow me on Twitter at Clancy's Corner. Follow the podcast Locked On AZ Cards. Thank you for making Locked On Cardinals your first listen free wherever you get your podcast and on YouTube, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Please go to the YouTube channel, search Locked On Arizona Cardinals. Hit the subscribe button, man and ma'am. Turn notifications on. Um, leave a like on the video. You know the drill. Thanks for being here. Every dayers, thank you for being with me, whether it's from day one in 2017 when I started this podcast or um, or when I guess when I took over this podcast or you know, if this is your first listen. Truly grateful for you. This episode of Locked on Cardinals is brought to you by Jace Medical. Empower yourself when you purchase a Jace case, providing you with a personal supply of five antibiotics to treat 50 plus infections. Get yours today at jacemedical.com and use code Locked On to get 20 bucks off your order. That's J A S E medical.com. So, for those who have listened to the last couple podcasts, I have alluded to something that is wrong with me inside my brain where when I get too excited for things, I start talking about them too early. So what I do is I kind of push it off a little bit so I don't get too excited and I correlate that to the March Madness bracket when it comes out on Selection Sunday. I don't normally fill my bracket out until Wednesday. I don't even look at it because I don't want to fill it out right away and then just be going over it, looking at it, looking at it. Do I change it? Do I change it? I'm so excited. I'm so excited. I'm like a Jack Russell Terrier when you know I get excited about something. But I mean – you can't help but dive right into mock drafts because the Cardinal season's over. Yeah, the playoffs are going to be fun because we love football, but the Cardinal season's over. The real season has begun. We've gotten through the transitional phase. The changing of the guard is now complete. And now it's time to make this roster better. So who am I to keep myself in a closet somewhere away from all of these beautiful and juicy mock drafts. And I do get, want to give a tip of the cap one last time to Matt Prater for missing that field goal. Now we can talk about it because picking fifth and picking fourth is immeasurably different. Immeasurably different. Not only with choice of player, but also with power that comes with it. I equate the top of the NFL draft to the Richter scale for those who are in you know California or have spent time in California, been through earthquakes, um, a 4.0 and a 5.0 It's like, oh, it's just one more. No, I think it's like 100 times more severe. And it goes incrementally higher. So having the fourth pick instead of the fifth is massive just for just the power involved. Look what happened with the Cardinals last year with the third pick. They opened up Pandora's box to possibilities for the future through the draft with that pick. They would have picked fourth. Maybe they wouldn't have been able to do that. So – what I'm going to kind of break down here, and this is going to be very light. This is going to be very overviewish. Uh, just a first, you know, toe into the pond of the 2024 NFL draft. But I think that it's time. Uh, I've got a lot of DMs about it. It's, let's talk about the draft now. Okay. You're going to get it. So first segment's going to be options at number four overall. This is not going to turn into a Marvin Harrison or not debate at all. This is going to be making arguments for all of them, for all the options. And then the tricky one is the Houston's pick. Because if they – so if they lose to Cleveland, they're going to pick 21st, which means the Cardinals will pick 21st. If they win and then lose in the divisional round, I believe they'll be picking 27th, which is, you know, you can make an argument for it being, oh, it's the same, or nope, every single order, every single number the Cardinals can be as close to one as possible for this draft specifically is beneficial. So – you know, I'll, I'll I'll discuss that options at 21 and or 27, whatever it may be. And then the trade up, trade back talks I'll do in the final segment because that's, that's where we get to put our GM hat on and just say, you know what, is this plausible? Would this help the team? The Cardinals have six picks in the top 96, I think. I think the last pick they have in the top 100 is 96. They have two firsts, a second, and three thirds. That's what you call ammunition. 
if Monty Osborne wants to get wild and wacky, he's got he's got the picks to do so. So let's pivot here. I've <laughs> I've stalled long enough. Marvin Harrison Jr. at four is a world we'll live in if 100% of third quarterback comes out of the woodwork and is undeniably needed to be drafted after Caleb Williams and Drake May. If not, you could a thousand percent see New England draft Marvin Harrison Jr. and then you know bring in a, a veteran quarterback. But whoever is leading the charge over there, I just don't know if they want to do the rookie quarterback thing again, especially if it's not Caleb Williams or Drake May for that matter. So say the Cardinals have the fourth overall pick and Marvin Harrison Jr. is available. Just hear me out, okay? Because now we're putting names to this instead of Marvin Harrison Jr. and then everybody else. So you can go one of two ways. You can look at the offensive line this year and see Jalti Froholt, Will Hernandez, and Paris Johnson Jr. on the right side playing average to above average football more than not this season. Like, you know what? You can get a left tackle in the 20s, or you can bring one in through free agency and then sign a left guard. Or if you can move left, Kevin Beecham guard, I don't know if he has the ability to play left guard. I, I don't know that. I'm I don't go that deep with with you know Wiley Vets who you know he's played all over the offensive line. I don't know if he has that in his arsenal. So that's an option. You can draft an offensive lineman in the second round. The one thing that the cautionary tale for offensive linemen and free agency are their tales. I guess there's two. One, just like any free agent, unless it's purely contractual. They're a free agent for a reason. Injury, play on the field, locker room, you know, whatever it is. The team who had them the year before would have retained them if they were worth the money that they're seeking elsewhere. Now, again, it could be contractual, could be they've already paid a quarterback and, you know, they don't have the money to pay a left tackle premium dollars, you know, whatever. So, I mean, obviously every, every team and every player has their little nuances. That's one. And then the other cautionary tale is I call it the Nate Solder effect. There have been 10, 12, 14 offensive linemen, not just left tackles, not just right tackles, guards, centers, who have gone somewhere else in free agency, struck it rich, and fallen off the, fallen off the cliff production-wise. And, yeah, like throw injury out of it. Unless, you know, somebody has, you know, an ACL tear and, you know, and, and has a torn bicep or something that caused them to miss two seasons and they want – premium dollars like well you know we're going to look elsewhere because of it but drafting an offensive lineman and hitting is as important if not maybe more important than hitting on a wide receiver kyler murray is the most important player on this team protect kyler murray win more games and that's not saying that drafting marvin harrison jr is the wrong thing it's just, I'm looking at Monty Austin for it. And I look at how he handled last year's draft. And it's like, this is the GM who would pass on Marvin Harrison Jr. Or who would trade back, who would try to find a partner who wanted him. And like, say the Chargers want him, okay? This is this is an interesting scenario. Like, say the Chargers, and I'll talk about this in the trade back. I'm going to wait. That's what we call a tease. I get too excited. Stop it. Marvin Harrison Jr., Joe Alt, uh, Olu Fashionu, um from Penn State. Like, when it comes down to the fourth overall pick, first, Marvin Harrison Jr. is going to have to be there. And then second, what do you want the foundation of this team to be? Because it's starting from scratch. Monty Ossifor walked into a rare case where, here you go. You choose the future of this organization. Obviously, with the help of Michael Bidwell and, you know, Jonathan Gannon and Kyler Murray and all that stuff. It is a fascinating position. Will he eat the vegetables that Steve Kime refused to do for a decade? He will be put to the test immediately with Marvin Harrison Jr. sitting there. But with that pick in the 20s and eight wide receivers going in the first round, and I know this is, this is a deep offensive lineman draft too, but it's like, 
is this is this is the question, and this is what we'll ponder, and this is what I'll pivot from. Is the top of the wide receiver group more above with a wide gap than the remaining of the wide receivers than the top of the offensive lineman group as pertains to the rest of the offensive linemen in this draft? That's what's going to have to be decided because if Joe Alt or the kid from Penn State are one and two, and then it's 100 and below for the rest of the offensive linemen, and Marvin Harrison Jr. is one, and then the rest are, you know, only two rungs below or whatever. I'm using weird, you know, um, uh, analogies here, but I'm assuming you're getting my drift. Is it more beneficial to take the offensive lineman and draft a wide receiver in the 20s or not? Or you just take Marvin, Marvin Harrison Jr. to set and forget? Man, this is going to be fun. Locked on Cardinals, your team every day. The Texans pick in the 20s that the Cardinals have hold of. What is that going to look like? What are the options there? We'll discuss in this way too early draft primer. But I got to antsy. You got to do it. That's next. Locked on Cardinals, your team every day. This episode of Locked on Cardinals is brought to you by Jace Medical. I know we come, you know, to sports to escape from some of the crazy realities of real life, but can we just talk for a minute about preparing for real life? According to the FDA, pharmacies are running out of antibiotics like amoxicillin right in the middle of the worst flu season in over a decade, which is scary, you know, and I can't imagine a more helpless feeling than, you know, a family member or something like that, or one of, you know, your kids got sick while a supply chain issue kept them from the life-saving medications they needed. Thankfully, will be okay because of Jace Medical. The Jace case is a pack of five different antibiotics to treat a long list of bacterial illnesses, including UTIs, respiratory infections, sinusitis, skin infections, among others. And this stuff can happen to any of us with jacemedical.com and complete, um, so visit jacemedical.com and complete your physician encounter. It'll be reviewed by a board certified physician and your medications will be dispersed and dispensed by a uh, licensed pharmacy at a fraction of the regular cost. It's never been more important to be prepared than today. Go to jacemedical.com and use code locked on to get 20 bucks off your order. This episode of Locked on Cardinals is also brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is awesome, man. Basketball season, football's around, combo projections like pretty much Prize Picks, you pick a player and their projected stat, and you pick more or less than that projected stat. You're not playing against other people, it's you versus the projections. That's it. They've got this reboot policy. So here you go. So say you pick a player and they get injured in the first half and they don't come back in the second half. That player is rebooted in your projection string so you don't get knocked for a player getting injured. It's wild. It's PrizePix is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. So go to prizepix.com slash locked on NFL and use code Locked on NFL for a first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. Again, go to pricepicks.com slash locked on NFL and use code locked on NFL for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars. Second segment, locked on Cardinals, Alex Clancy here. Follow me on Twitter, Clancy's Corner, follow the podcast at Locked On AZ Cards. Thanks for making Locked On Cardinals your first listen. Free wherever you get your podcast and on YouTube, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day so that was the fourth big this is going to be discussed i mean we've got months we've got months to break down the fourth overall pick okay i just wanted to do i I felt like we all deserve this you deserved it i deserved it a little look into a couple months from now in april where everything's going to change and everything i I mean it'll be fascinating to see how much changes before that how many big name free agency big name free agency sign like the big thing is how many players who are on the roster this year won't be on the roster next year. Less than half of the players that ended the 2022 season on the roster with the Cardinals were on the roster in 2023. So this is going to be a massive overhaul. Massive overhaul with Monty Osborne calling the shots. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be amazing. So uh, say Houston loses to Cleveland this weekend, they'll be picking 21st. If they win this weekend and then lose in the divisional round, they'll be picking 27th. So there's here are some names. Okay, here are some options for the Cardinals at that at that spot. And this is all predicated upon the draft 
pick that they make it for. So if they draft Marvin Harrison Jr., they're most not likely they're most likely not going to draft a um, a wide receiver uh, in, in in the twenties. We've seen crazier things, but the the big name here, and I don't think he'll fall this far. But my boy Trevor Sikkim over Pro Football Focus, who I'll have on the show in the next week or so, I believe. Um, he has Cooley McKinstry from, from Alabama, the, the number one corner dropping to the twenties. And in, 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 I, I'm going to ask you about this cause I'm fascinated, you know, in drafts like this, where they're so heavy in so many other positions other than corner, why wouldn't he go in the top, like a team that needs a, a corner or like the fourth wide receiver. Why not take the top corner? I, I, you know, it's, I don't see we the, every draft. There's a corner that goes higher than we expected. It was J.C. Horn a couple of years ago. Um, Greg Newsom actually went around where where uh, where we thought he was going to go. Like there's always a corner that goes early, and I feel like it could be this year. Um, there's always a weird pick in the in the top ten. Now, having said that, with all of the wide receivers and all of the quarterbacks and the offensive linemen, he may drop. I just don't think that that's going to be. I don't think it's going to be possible. And listen, I, I will talk. To, uh, I'll talk to Trevor Sikkim. I'll talk to a lot of draft guys, um, you know, over the next – and ladies over the next couple months. Um, so let's say they don't take a wide receiver at four. Let's just say that. Let's placate my nerves when I think they should take an offensive lineman and then, you know, they take a wide receiver in, in the 20s. Now, 21 and 27 are vastly different um, in, in that regard, especially with, you know, probably four or five wide receivers going in the top 12 – or 15, and then there's a couple that'll trickle down at the end. Like you're looking at a, at a Keon Coleman, a Troy Frank, Keon Coleman from Florida State, big outside receiver, Troy Franklin, who's been my favorite. Um, I love Jordan Addison last year coming out. He's a little undersized. Troy Frank, Franklin was an absolute baller at Oregon. Bo Nix is number one receiver in that high powered offense. I struggle because. This offense, and I know that Drew Petson, like if the Cardinals win 10 games next year, Drew Petson's probably gone. He's probably going to get a head coaching job. And we need to normalize. Remember this, folks. I told you all offseason, all regular season, appreciate football. That was me. From the guy that brought you that, you know, rare thought. Here's another one that I will, that I'm going to be going on. I, I will be, this will be my campaign for my campaign foundation. Pay coordinators like head coaches. And keep that. Pay coordinators like head coaches and keep that. So you can have a system, Josh McDaniels, Eric Bieniemy, and just roll through wins every year. That's it. Um, the, this offense, does it need a stud wide receiver one? Does it absolutely need it? Would you rather have three B wide receivers or and an A tight end like, I just don't – Trey McBride is a stud. Michael Wilson has shown, and I know that he was injured, and I know he had a couple offers, one of which was when Kyler Murray first came back. Uh, but the last couple of games of the year, he balled out. I'm talking myself into a situation. I'm in this. I'm not talking myself into this. I'm in this situation where I am looking for the right path where the Cardinals draft the top tackle – instead of Marvin Harrison Jr. And I know the more that I discuss and the more I talk about it, I don't do it to be different. I don't, I understand how much fun drafting Marvin Harrison Jr. Obviously. But if you can get a Troy Franklin or Keon Coleman in the twenties and get your left tackle for the future or right tackle, depending if they move Paris Johnson Jr. over, a lot still needs to be determined. I think that is more beneficial than drafting Marvin Harrison Jr. and hoping you can get a tackle of worth in the 20s or Kool-Aid McKinstry still being there. Like if you draft a wide receiver, then you're almost pigeonholing yourself into signing a left tackle and free agent, a retread of some sort. Left tackle is the most important position aside from quarterback. Draft one. Set and forget. You have Paris Johnson Jr. and Joe Alt for the like for the next decade. Set and forget. Offensive line there. And you know what? When quarterbacks have more time, 
that makes wide receivers look better because corners have to cover for longer. And cornerback is the toughest position to play in football. Just food for thought. So, you know, in the 20s, Cooley McKinstry is the, the apple of people's eye in that area for the Cardinals. I've seen multiple mock drafts mocking the, the Cardinals drafting Kool-Aid there, which, listen, the Cardinals eat corners, the Cardinals eat interior defensive line, the Cardinals eat everything. But it's a sneaky spot where if they can get a wide receiver, wouldn't be the worst thing. Because there are still guys. Like, on some people's words, Keon Coleman's top three, top five. Like Malik Neighbors is there at LSU. There are going to be so many. And guess what? Not all of them are going to be great. So just because one goes higher, just because one's mocked higher, this is what Monty Osford and Jonathan Gannon have done. They And Dave Sears, they've got scouting in their blood. This is what they do. This is where they eat. So if they don't draft Marvin Harrison Jr., They've got a plan that they think is better for this team. And it's going to be fascinating come mid-April to see what that is. All right, the fun stuff now. Trade up, trade down possibilities. Let's rip it. Alex Clancy locked on Cardinals. I will discuss that right after this. This episode of Locked on Cardinals is brought to you by BetterHelp. Um, you know, the holidays are tough, man. The new year, things like that. And, you know, it's, it it can be overwhelming where it's like, you know, we get obsessed with how to change ourselves instead of just expanding on what we're already doing. Right. You know, a lot of people, a lot of feet in the fire saying, well, listen, I'm doing really well here. I'm not doing well here. And you focus on what you're not doing well, instead of accentuating and, you know, appreciating what you're doing well. Okay. Therapy helps you find your strengths so you can ditch the extreme resolutions and make changes that, that really stick. And if you're thinking of starting therapy, give better help a try. It's entirely online designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Celebrate the progress you've already made. Visit betterhelp.com slash locked on to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H E L P.com slash locked on. This is fun. I can do this for an hour. I can do this for an hour and a half. Just talking draft. I mean, this is, see, the difference between this year and last year. And years passed, but really between this year and last year was last year, they were underwater. So anything the Cardinals would have done, it would have helped, but it doesn't show like true concrete evidence of such. First of all, because the Cardinals had, I mean, the Cardinals fans, I'm assuming I, you know, you don't have trust in your GM to draft well because that's what's experienced the last 10 years. So not only going into the offseason before they knew that they were removing Steve Kime and Cliff Kingsbury. It's like, oh, here we go again. What's Steve? What's Stevie Baby going to do with the third overall pick now? And then fire him, bring in a guy who's never been a GM, bring in a head coach who's never been a head coach, bring in two coordinators who've never been coordinators. With Michael Bidwell calling the shot, it's like, well, this probably won't. You know, it, it's just like, it's just the definition of insanity. The Arizona Cardinals, up until this point, have been the definition of insanity. So you go through the draft last year, and it's like, okay, trade. Oh, trade. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, they got a future first. Huh, Will Anderson. Will Anderson probably would have been good for this team. And then uh, 12, what are they going to get at 12? Oh, they trade back in the. This man seems to have a plan here. Anyway, they moved back. They moved up six spots to get Paris Johnson Jr. Didn't have to give up the first round pick that they just got. They just had to give up the second round pick that they were just given 10 minutes ago. What is this? And then you see the rest of the draft. But still, B.J. Ojolari, LSU, Michael Wilson, Stanford, Garrett Williams, Syracuse, John Gaines, UCLA. Like, big schools. Big schools. It's like, whoa. If this works... 
This seems to, this is how normal teams draft. What is going on here? But then still, going into the preseason, going to the regular season, Kyler Murray's not playing. This team's losing a lot of games. It's hard to really put into context a draft like that until you see the full season. So after the draft, it's like, okay, I'm excited. This On paper, this seems like it could work. But everything in your brain, it's like, well, oh, this is just going to be the same thing over and over and over again. And then you saw through the season, okay, things are working. Paris Johnson Jr. played pretty well, didn't miss a snap. Michael Wilson had flashes of wide receiver one. He didn't play great all year. He was hurt for a large chunk, but he had flashes of wide receiver one. He did. Garrett Williams played okay. It, there was no what I call the oh no moments where you draft a player like, yep, he's not ready to play in the NFL yet. That's what Marco Wilson was for the entirety of his time here. But going into this draft, there's substance. There's something to build on. The last handful of games with Kyler Murray playing, it's like, okay, this is a team with no fat on it, talent-wise. This is the bones. And sure, you've got your talent. I mean, James Conner had a great year, like, but like top to bottom, not a whole lot of talent, especially on the defensive side of the ball. And the Cardinals competed the entire year. They probably should have won seven games, maybe eight games, really, if you go back and look, with no roster. That's coaching. That's preparation. That's game plan. That's game scheme. So you go into the draft this year, and it's like, let's roll. Do it again. Repeat the same draft that you did last year with the with the impactful nature of it. And now you can bring in free agents and you're compounding. It's like compounding interest based upon last year. And then you bring in some more young players this year. The Cardinals had more rookie, had more rookie snaps played than any other team in the NFL this year. And I said that every day as you've heard this, <laughs> I don't apologize because it's important. If this is your first listen, thank you. Young players being able to play meaningful snaps without any pressure on them is something that has been devoid of existence from the Arizona Cardinals with Steve Kime as GM. Why? Because Steve Kime was unable to build a roster. So Marco Wilson, the Cardinals move up from the fifth round to the fourth, draft him in the fourth round, and they just throw him out there because Steve Kime forgot that the cornerback position was a position on a roster. For years. Forever. He had Brandon Williams starting alongside Patrick Peterson a handful of years ago. Dude who played running back in college. It's like, it's it was lunacy. So a lot of rookies the Cardinals had, and a lot of players over the last handful of years the Cardinals have had, have never been given a fair shot to play what they, what, what are their, to their strengths, like Hassan Reddick. Do you think that Jonathan Gannon and Nick Rallis wouldn't know where to put Hassan Reddick? He'd still be on the damn team. So this year, luckily, I mean, one of the only upsides to Kyler Murray being injured is like these young rookies could just go play. There's no expectation for win loss. It's a new, it's a new GM. It's a brand new head coach, new coordinators. Go play. And Paris Johnson Jr. played against 10, 12 of the best fronts in football. And held his own right away. So if the Cardinals can replicate that, and it'll be different. Obviously, if they draft Marvin Harrison Jr., they draft another offensive lineman, Kool-Aid McKintree, whatever it may be. And then they've got multiple picks after that. That's when you start to see the motion. You add a couple of veteran players, and you're off to the races. Now, with the trade up and trade back, really quickly, will the Cardinals trade up from four? No. No. The only world where I'd see they trade up from four, which would obviously be to get Marvin Harrison Jr., is giving up one of their third-round picks of the three that they have. I don't think that'd be enough to move up even one spot that high in the draft. I just don't see it. Okay? Could they trade up from the 20s? This is where it gets fun. Because Monty Austin Fort, going into the draft, just go in with a clear mind. Because Monty Austin Fort's going to get weird. He's going to get weird. We saw it already. That's not like... For somebody that does that right away, I know he's calling his boy Nick Casario, okay? I, I know that. But I think that uh, 
You don't come out of the gates like that if that's not how you're going to do things if the opportunity arises. So if, say they pick 27th. Say they pick 21st. Let's start there. Say Houston loses to Cleveland. I don't care. I, I kind of want CJ Stroud to make the Super Bowl at this point. Like, just go nuts. It doesn't matter. Like, they already ruined that pick. So you may as well just you, you may as well just go in the Super Bowl. Say they're at 21, okay, and they've got their second-round pick and then three-thirds. I think they have Houston's, Indies, and theirs. I think that's right. Do you want to move up a couple spots, give up one of those thirds? If you're at 27, do you want to trade back and pick up another second? Like, that's the pick that you need to maximize the most. The first one is set and forget. I mean, unless somebody, unless there's a, like, this is the only case scenario the Cardinals would trade back in the, with the fourth overall pick is if Marvin Harrison Jr. goes third to New England or something, and then Jane Daniels is sitting there and somebody wants to move up. They're, look at look at Tankathon. Look at the draft order. Every team needs a quarterback. It's wild, except for the Chargers right behind them. Every team needs a quarterback. Say Atlanta at eight wants to move up and draft Jane Daniels, and they want to give you know an extra second this year and a third. And you could still get the guy you want most likely because it's going to be quarterbacks and wide receivers off the top. You got you've got to engage. You got to have conversations. But in the the Houston pick is the big one because there's a lot of flexibility there. It's really going to depend on who's there. So if everybody's gone that they would have wanted there and they're at 27 and somebody wants to move back into the first round and they'll give them an extra two, like that's where the flexibility is because the third round picks is another, like it's just, it's bargaining chips. The second round pick, I'm assuming you want to keep because that could be running back, that could be corner, or it could be interior defensive lineman. Like there's a lot of ways you can go with that. So in summation, the Cardinals trading up or trading back with the fourth overall pick? Trading up, no. Trading back only if Marvin Harrison Jr. goes before four, I would assume. Unless there are two other quarterback prospects. Like, that would be the most idyllic situation. If you can get a first, another first for that fourth pick overall, by trading back a little bit, you got to take it. You got to take it. And just know that if the Cardinals don't take Marvin Harrison Jr. at four, the Chargers will at five. So that's a clear understanding that that's the only spot the Cardinals will be able to get him if he's still there is at four because the Chargers 100% will take him at five. The Chargers may even offer too much with a new head coach to trade up to four for the Cardinals to get him. Like, that may be my favorite scenario now. There have been so many scenarios, and I'm going wrong at this point. My favorite scenario for the Cardinals – and this could change, but this is right now. It's January 10th. It goes quarterback, quarterback, quarterback. The Chargers offer a future first to move up one spot to get Marvin Harrison Jr. The Cardinals move back a spot, spot and take Joe Alt. That's my, that is my, oh boy, Oberto moment of the day. I wish oh boy, Oberto um, sponsored this. That would have been awesome. Anyways, um, this, these were the ramblings of a madman. I think condensed, but understand that this is only going to get more fun. If you haven't subscribed, please go to the YouTube channel, search Locked on Arizona Cardinals, hit the subscribe button. Go to Apple, Google Play, wherever you get your podcast, Stitcher, and just subscribe to Locked on Cardinals, man. You'll get a notification every time one drops. Alice Lindsay, Locked on Cardinals. I will talk to you tomorrow.